Okay, and welcome. Today we're going to continue our shirim on um, how to teach the Shev Mitzvah B'nai Noach. And what I'd like to focus on today is continuing in the Halchas Malachim of the Rambam and the Sefer Mishnah Teir and a brief overview that we're conducting of the now, uh, chapters that the Rambam dedicates. As we said before, this is really the preparation for the times of Mashiach. And uh, just like the Rambam is bringing these halachas in Hilchas Molochim of what's necessary to transform the world, it's the immediate predecessor to the coming of Mashiach and the halachas of Mashiach. And that's because this is something that uh, is very, very necessary. It's the hachana and the preparation and the reality of the coming of Mashiach. So in, let's delve in now. We're in chapter 9, Hilchus Malachim, uh, the first halacha. And here the Rambam uh, writes in a very interesting way because he is explaining really the whole history of the building up of the mitzvahs. The swarm that say that really the, uh, the Tariq mitzvahs, the 613 mitzvahs, are actually built on the foundation of the seven commandments that are given to all mankind. Sometimes he will learn the seven commandments of uh, the, the Sheva mitzvahs of Noach. I think they're kind of like a, a subset or, or less than on the side, and that's absolutely not the case. The Sheva mitzvahs are actually the yesed of Hashem's blueprint for all of humanity. The additional mitzvahs are added on top of that, and we see that very clearly in this halacha from the Rambam. The Rambam is making it clear that there is a progression from this fundamental, um, you say, this fundamental foundation of humanity and civilization, and then there were additional mitzvahs that were uh, brought into the forefront through God's command to the founders of the Jewish people, and then brought to completion to um, Moshe Ben Moses on, Har, on Har Sinai on Mount Sinai. So that's really the progression. And um, like we see by the um, Balaturim, he writes that the uh, 620 letters of the Ten Commandments, when they're given in the Torah, in Parshish Yisroi, corresponds to the 613 mitzvahs that are given to the Jewish people and the seven commandments that are given to the nations of the world, because in the 620 uh, letters through which the Ten Commandments were spoken, it includes the godly revelation, the Or Eliki, that was given to all of humanity simultaneously on Mount Sinai. And this is reflected in the way the Rambam is recording over here, that at the beginning there were six commandments given to the first man, not to worship idols, not to curse God's name, on uh, not to murder, not to be sexually immoral, and not to steal, and to have courts of law to establish justice. So even though they are all um, received in our uh, for us to, through Moshe Rabbeinu, and they they seem to make sense, um, never the t nevertheless that. It's, we see from the words of the Torah that these were commandments, uh, that there's, there's Sukkim in the Torah that we could see that this is something that uh, these, these six points were commanded to the first man. He doesn't bring what those words of the Torah are, but um, there's other Meforshim uh, that do explain the, how to understand the, the, the uh, verses in the book of Genesis as including specifically these six commandments. Then God added for Noach the Aver Minachai, which is not to eat the limb of a living animal. And um, uh, not to eat uh, not to eat live, 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 limb of a living animal, an animal while it's still flowing with its lifeblood. Um, and that counts as seven mitzvahs together. Now, this was the way the world was until came along Avraham, the forefather of the Jewish people, who we said before, Avraham's special quality was that he took on this mission to 
teach the entire world about the knowledge of God and that God loves all of humanity. Avram came along, the Rambam says, and he commanded uh, additionally, he was commanded additionally on the uh, commandment to circumcise. And then he added a special morning prayer service. And then his son Yitzhak uh, gave uh, Meiser, gave a 10% of what he uh, was his, his sustenance of his, um, of his income. Uh, and he added an additional prayer service in the afternoon. And then Yaakov added uh, the uh, commandment not to eat the Gidnosha, that's a part of the one of the um, sinews in the, um, in the animal. And he, Davin, the, he prayed the evening prayer. And now, one thing we have to be very clear about over here is that while the Ramam is giving these uh, delineations of the, the development, um, all humanity is required to prayer to required to pray uh, for their needs, and we'll learn that later, and the sources for that. And also, he, all humanity is required to give um, from their earnings to uh, help others. So, even though it says over here brings that Avram brought about this morning prayer uh, service, it uh, is not a meaning that a non-Jew doesn't have to pray. On the contrary, a non-Jew does have to pray for his needs. Um, but there is something unique about this prayer service, the morning, e afternoon, and evening prayer services, which is a, um, became an, a, a um, foundational or a, a integral part of the Jewish uh, service of God, but every human being does need to be pray. Does need to pray, and then we need to um, show an example on how a person is meant to communicate with their Creator. And then in Egypt, there was a commandments to Amram uh, with additional commandments, and then Moshe Rabbeinu came, and he completed the Torah. The Torah was completed through his hand. So that's the the um, broad stroke of the history of the mitzvahs of the commandments commandments are the means by which uh, man binds himself to and connects himself to his commander to the creator and uh this is the the course of the history of how these mitzvahs came to be how these commandments came to be in the second halacha the rambam talks about the commandment not to worship idols this is something that is uh, forbidden to a non-Jew and any human being. And this is so long as he, he serves the Avay de Zorah in its usual way. And uh, any Avay de Zorah that a Jewish court of law would execute somebody for serving that type of uh, idolatrous practice is something that is also... Uh, results in the death penalty for the for the non-Jewish person. Uh, if the if it's not something that a practice that the, not the Jewish court would execute for, then also a ben neach, a a, uh, a human being, a gentile is also not executed. And even though uh, it, it, a service of an idol might not, in a particular case, result in the death penalty for transgressing and, and serving that idol, uh, nevertheless, it's, com it's still completely forbidden for a non-Jew uh, to worship any for form of idolatry. And we, we don't let a non-Jew set up any sort of est established structures to worship through uh, foreign gods and not to plant trees that are especially, a share trees which are specially dedicated for the service of, of uh, idols and not to make um, different forms and, and images that are part of idol worship, uh, and even if they're meant just for the uh, beauty of them. And then in the next halacha, the, the uh, Rambam says that uh, brings the, the halacha that a ben a, uh, a human being, is not allowed to curse God, and uh, that's whether he uses one of Hashem's special names um, or whether he uses one of God's names uh, in a different language.
or a, an expression that's typically used to refer, refer to God. Uh, that's a more stringent matter that on the non-Jews than on the Jews in terms of this point about the, using other languages and so forth and, and the, the nicknames or, or, or common vernacular expressions for God as opposed to God's special names. Um, and then in the fourth uh, halacha, the uh, Ramam writes here that a non a non Jew a, a human being who kills a, a human soul, even if it's merely a fetus in the womb of its mother, that person uh, is liable for the death penalty, and that is uh, very clear here that abortion is forbidden for all of humanity. Uh, if this is, applies, even if the person was already disabled, already likely to die in a very short period of time, uh, it is forbidden for a human being to lead to the death of another human being. Um, or even if a person just takes a person and says they're not going to kill them, but they're going to put them, the example he gives is puts them in a dangerous situation that they will be killed by in front of a lion. Uh, and then they're killed, obviously that person's liable, or a person leaves a person to starve, and that person then dies. That's also uh, forbidden and liable to death penalty for that type of action. Um, I, it's very fascinating that this he says over here that if he's killing a person that's you know a wounded person, um, we see that uh, today, unfortunately, um, people are, are losing track of the fundamental moral compass of humanity and beginning to be adopted in different countries and different states, physician-assisted suicide. And um, participation in this is completely forbidden by, for any human being to participate. And it is murder for a doctor to give a poison to a patient, even if the poison, patient um, it requests it. And here we see that uh, if he, th this is referred to here in the case where the Rambam is saying, even if the person is a, is a wounded person or is a person who's you know, not, not able to continue to live according to what meets our eyes, the fact of the matter is it's still murder to do anything to hasten their death. And that's something that as the, as the educators for the world, the people who are entrusted with the responsibility to educate to the world, this is really our responsibility to teach this. And as, as teachers to the world, we have to recognize the responsibility goes to the extent that if, if a percentage of a person is a human being has lost sight of this principle and feels out of a sense of compassion that uh, he's in favor of letting doctors kill their patients at the patient's request, um, that is a sign of the lack of teaching from the Jewish people because we have become accustomed to society and civilization working on a certain level because of the extent to which fundamental Jewish principles became the norm within civilizations. And we assume that it's going to stay that way. But it only stays that way so long as the input is coming from those fundamental Jewish principles. And as soon as those fundamental Jewish principles are removed, whether taught directly by the Jewish people or taught by people who have adopted certain Jewish principles and certain Jewish teachings, when those no longer become the norm of, of education and the way a child is brought up, then people begin to make different calculations as to what is the basis, uh, on, under what circumstances could they participate or should someone be able to take their own lives or have a doctor kill them? And that uh, fundamentally points, therefore, to an erosion in those pillars of human society that were based on Jewish principles and that became universal. And uh, in addition, the, the, when I say Jewish principles, obviously these, these are principles that were taught, were, were commanded to uh, Adam, the first man, and to Noah, uh, his descendant, and when he came off the ark, and all of humanity between, before and after. But the Jewish people are 
uh, charged with the mission of spreading that message. So that we see today that the primary um, voices of carrying a uh, prohibitions on murder and so forth are either um, the vestiges of old laws that were enacted by people who were infused with the sense of the primacy of a human life, which came through teachings of scripture, whether directly through learning the, the Jewish Bible or through learning uh, the teachings of other uh, or later traditions that uh, adopted the Jewish Bible in whole or in part. And those then became the fundamental elements of civilization and they uh, are, are now taken for granted, except that since the other traditions have stopped, uh, in many cases, teaching these principles, uh, some have adopted thinking that reflects the ability of a doctor to kill their patient. And because most children are now educated in secular school systems where it is forbidden to mention God, and it is forbidden to mention that there's divine commandments, then most children are being raised increasingly with a complete lack of an understanding of the any sort of moral compass. The moral compass of today is more uh, either the pain and pleasure calculus for oneself and then a pain and pleasure calculus for somebody else. So if the pain is the main way to determine what's right and wrong, or pleasure is the main way to determine if what's right or wrong, then it becomes appropriate to say, well, why should that person suffer in pain? Let them be killed, uh, especially if they ask for it. And once they're, that's the standard, then well, if they didn't ask for it, but it would be a compassion for them, then and take them out of pain, then that becomes the next logical step once it's based on human reason. And we see that in, a, um, in Holland, for example, where one in four doctors reported taking the lives of their patients, even without their consent, out of a misguided sense of pa uh, compassion because it's now based on human logic uh, and now that becomes the, the guiding um, measure. So the challenge then is that we have to ask ourselves if this is eroding these principles that were for humanity for thousands of years said that they will not allow a doctor to prescribe a poison to a patient who wants to kill themselves, even if the patient asks for it. It was, it was um, even recorded and, and memorialized. The result of this debate among humanity was recorded in, in something called the Hippocratic Oath, which is not uh, a monotheistic uh, document, but it shows, uh, and I don't cite it as an authority, other than to point out that humanity came to a conclusion that doctors would not allow, be allowed to kill people. And that was obviously because of the influence of the, the divine wisdom that came to, th through, to humanity through Adam and, and his descendants and Noah and, and then through the Jewish people and through Moses on Mount Sinai. So now we are living in the luxury of the last vestiges, the remnants of those teachings that kind of were implanted into humanity through uh, either through teachings from the Jewish people directly or through other people who were inspired by the Jewish people's teachings. And uh, we're seeing now that increasing numbers of people no longer feel any sense of attachment to those ideas. And as a result, we are facing a situation where there's an increasing and increasing uh, abandonment of a divine morality and a uh, divine commands that are right because they're de divine and we don't mix in our human logic to try to figure out what makes more sense from pleasure or from pain, um, then the end result is that we end up in a situation where doctors are being allowed and, and the laws are being changed to allow them to, to murder their patients. So this, is a, this shows us the vacuum, the tremendous vacuum that is coming about as a result of the Jewish people not being proactive in teaching. So my point to you, as somebody who has an obligation as a teacher to the nations of the world, is that when you see somebody who supports physician-assisted suicide as just one example, or as a doctor who practices physician-assisted suicide, the, the responsibility 
for that person's misguided um, conclusion as to what's right and wrong falls squarely uh, on, on my shoulders because I have not done enough to teach that person, to reach that person. And I suggest that responsibility is shared by all the Jewish people, uh, particularly those that are aware of the commandments, particularly those that learn the Rambam, who learn Maimonides. If we learn of my Rambam and we learn Maimonides and we see that the Rambam writes that murder is forbidden, that abortion is forbidden, that uh, for, if any type of uh, assisting and killing somebody is forbidden, then when the laws of the nations are changing, there's only one place to uh, say, well, who, who has to take responsibility for that? And that's us. That's our responsibility. And the truth of the matter is that all of humanity is already warned and trained in these things. So they're, the, every human being is responsible for their conduct. But we are responsible to show the way and, and to show the light. And so I believe that, and I think that the, this is what the Torah is saying, is that we're responsible. We see by Avram's example that on one hand, he took responsibility uh, for the well-being, the spiritual well-being of all of humanity. But in addition, when he wasn't able to reach people, he did not write them off and say, okay, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah are sinners and therefore just let them be eradicated. That would have made his job easier if all these recalcitrant people that were so stubborn in their sinful ways were going to be eliminated by God. Um, they didn't seem to be eager customers for Abraham's uh, spiritual offerings anyways. So uh, why not let God go ahead and, and eradicate these people? And a Abraham, our father's uh, approach was no. He, he stood up for those people. He prayed for those people. He argued with God to save those people because he knows and he knows that God's intention is every one of those people should have the ability to return to God and have the experience of, of living in God's living embrace and loving embrace, which is, which is what's meant for every human being. So this is our responsibility to be the students of Avraham because we are his children. And to teach the rest of the nations and to advocate on their behalf that they should be healthy and they should be spared any form of punishment whatsoever. Instead, our, we should be replacing the absolute void of spiritual light in their lives that come from the combination of completely secular schooling Compare, uh, combined with uh, atrocious television programming and movies that, that advocate the uh, complete abolishment of any right and wrong and expose a person to images and uh, glorifying acts of murder and other immorality, that's what our, that's the vacuum that we are, the abyss of the vacuum that we are standing on, at the, on the verge of it and in the midst of. So our, our call to action is that your non-Jewish neighbor needs to hear from you. The non-Jewish person who um, is, a, is not aware needs to hear from you. The non-Jewish people who are uh, aware but have mislabeled uh, the identity of God need to hear from you. The non-Jewish people who are convinced that they know the difference between right and wrong, except they're not getting it through the right source, which is Moses on Mount Sinai, through the Jewish people. Uh, they need to be heard. They need to hear from you. So that's what this is. This is the call of the hour. This is why this is so vital. And this is why the, the erosion of the fundamental belief system of the world that was brought through God's revelation originally as it becomes darker and darker, our job is to increase in what we're, what the, the light that we are bringing forth into the world. Now, to conclude this halacha over here, the Rambam also brings that if a person is uh, going to kill a murderer, uh, that he could have saved the person who's at the risk of being murdered by merely um, harming the murderer 
or the, the, the person is attempting a murder um, and he could have, let's say, you know, sh cut off his foot as an example uh, and, and prevented that person from being able to do the murder, but instead he actually killed the person, that is a capital offense in, uh, in the, under the seven laws of Noah. And um, that's something that is an interesting uh, thing to discuss as to why that would be. Namely, that uh, the, if there is a possibility, obviously, we're, we know the, the, a, a, uh, the question is here, and, and this is not the question for this forum, if the person didn't uh, see um, another possibility, obviously, that's something that has to be adjudicated by the court of law. But we're not talking here about a murderer's first philosophy in any way whatsoever, God forbid. On the contrary, uh, we're talking here about the primacy of human life and the person who has the bravery and the courage to stand up and to confront a murderer and to stop him, um, that's something that is going to be given a lot of credit in the court. And, uh, and, and what I think what we're talking about here is a situation where a person um, went ahead and sort of vindictively or unnecessarily uh, went ahead and killed somebody who was a pursuer. But we can examine that more in, in future classes. So um, at this time, we're gonna pause and we'll continue uh, next time with some of the additional commandments that are commanded to the nations of the world. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share this divine wisdom with you and these halachas with you. And uh, my prayer is that this, you yourself will become the teacher to all those that you have influence on and have the opportunity to have influence on and who are waiting for you eagerly, literally with bated breath, for you to share with them what we're learning here right now.